In the latest episode of Chat About Geopolitics and Trade, you will learn about why it is critical to take a holistic view of the world in analyzing shipping markets, the most unusual data requests by clients, and the importance of scenario analysis for geopolitical events impacting shipping. Welcome to the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast, and today Pune Osa, founder of Maritime NXT, will be focusing on shipping research and analysis with our shipbroking group. Thank you so much, Marcus. This is a great privilege to uh, host this particular podcast, uh, the chat about geopolitics and trade. Today, we actually have Burak Chitinok, who's the head of research in Arrow Shipbroking. Burak is quite well known in the research space, but more interestingly, he comes from the broking side, which is always an interesting perspective when it comes to geopolitics and trade. And that is why today, it's a pleasure to have you, Burak. Maybe you can just start with a quick introduction. I see a lot of companies where you have worked and studied institutions where you have studied, where I've got some commonalities, but we can talk more about that. But maybe just a quick introduction and welcome to the program. Thanks, Punit. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting. Just a little bit of a background. I'm an engineer by education, uh, a mechanical engineer, actually. And um, earlier in my career, I wasn't working in the shipping industry, but you know, it's, you know, shipping, you know, it pulls you in and once you're in, you're in. And I think it was around 2004, 2005 that I started working at the shipyard in Turkey, building small chemical tankers. And I was a planning engineer at the time. Then I joined CAS uh, around 2007, probably a few years late after you did. And since then it's, it's, it's been, it's been, you know, Fast forward to, you know, 14, 15 years, here I am, I'm, um, you know, like heading the research desk at Arrow. And uh, it's it's very exciting times because what we do has evolved tremendously, I would say, over the past five years. And I think it evolved into a different different role. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's the great part. In fact, Arrow itself has a fascinating story. I used to be in Noble in Hong Kong and at that time, Jeremy uh, and Gibson opened up leaving Har Robinson. And, you know, just to think how much time has passed and, and, and things have moved on. Obviously, you guys have moved into a, a whole different level altogether. My time in Clavness, you guys were very active with us in fixing as well. So I've got multiple linkages and touch points that, that I'm um, always excited to talk about. Of course, CAS Base, which is uh, very much a, a part of the journey that you and I both have gone through. I probably went 10 years before you, but, uh, but it's always a pleasure to have that. Let me start with asking you a unique perspective that you guys bring when it comes to research in a broking shop. You know, I've worked in shipping companies as a ship owner, as a charterer, operator. You obviously have to focus on your job and look at specific area and data which is relevant to your decision making. But as a broker, you kind of have a much bigger view, a much wider helicopter view because you don't have to specifically focus on a trade or a particular sector, you are actually looking at the entire big picture. And that actually means that you're weaving and connecting dots between tankers and dry and and, and whatever you have. And that can be a, a huge advantage when it comes to the perspective, but that also has a bit of a challenge. How does research look to add value to a client, for example, and, and build on that because you don't have the risk in the business, but you still have to have a lot of value to bring to your clients. Uh, how does research come in that space here? Yeah? yeah, sure. That's a very good question. And I think you're absolutely right. We are in a unique position where we follow many different markets. And I think it's critical to what we do because you need to have a holistic view of the world, including geopolitics, to be able to come up with a firm opinion as to where things are moving. And at the core of what we do is to provide actionable data and insights to our clients and to our brokers. In a world where we are bombarded with information, it is critical to have access to the right information at the right time. And what we strive to do is to provide our clients and brokers with an opinion as to where the markets are moving. And that involves you know, integrating geopolitics, you know, views on different markets and so on and so forth. And we need to back this with sound analysis, which then you know, our clients hope to use that in their own decision making. And this, this has evolved a lot as well over the years because the data availability has, has evolved tremendously over the past five years. In the past, we used to work with very limited information, very limited data. 
and only the analysts involved in this field tended to have that access to that information. Now, everyone pretty much has access to the same information, same data, pretty much at the same time. So research has evolved in the sense that, you know, we have to work with huge amounts of data, lots of information. You know, we really need to, to, to combine all of that, you know, knowledge, information and, and skills to provide our clients with insights that can be actionable. And I think, you know, on that, on that note, I think the research name doesn't do justice anymore because what we do is really, it's a strategy desk. We, we try to help our clients with their freight strategy and investment strategy by providing them valuable information, actionable information at the right time. Absolutely. So, so maybe if you can give me an example of maybe the strangest data request that you've received from a client saying, I need the information on this. And then you kind of think about it. Why does he need information on that? I've had previous podcasts where seriously strange data points have actually been used by clients to to build um, models, for example. Um, have you actually had any strange data requests? What's the strangest one? Oh, wow. Yeah, we, we had quite a lot. I mean, it's not just the clients as well. I mean, we come across with many different types of very exotic data points when we do our research as well. And uh, it's a combination of clients asking as well as us discovering data. Then we, we find ways to, to integrate that information into our analysis. I mean, lately with the development in, in you know, technology and you know, access to, to data, I mean, we are using weather data a lot more in many different ways. I mean, shipping companies have been using weather data for, for decades now, but what we are trying to do is to predict production levels of iron ore, for instance, in Brazil, almost you know, on a, on a daily, weekly basis by, by following rainfall in areas where mines are located. And uh, we look at precipitation data, we look at soil moisture content, because that is really what matters, you know, as you know, if soil content of, of iron ore goes too high, then there is risk of, you know, liquefaction and so on and so forth. So that is an interesting one that we're really getting deep into. Another one came actually from one of your colleagues or your students, really. It was the um, effects of plant-based, you know, foods on global grain trades. I mean, it was, you know, we know, you know, that's happening, right? You know, there's a lot more interest in plant-based, you know, foods. But I never thought until that question came across hold on a second, what impact will this have on, on global grain trades? That was very interesting as well. I mean, COVID was a very interesting time as well, you know, when it comes to data exploration, because we were desperate to find out what was going on. And we needed to be high frequency enough to get, you know, real time you know, insights into what was going on. And during that time, we discovered, discovered a couple of really interesting ones. In Europe, one of the, the, the data points that we discovered was Germany trucking toll index to get an early indication of how industrial activity was moving, right? You know, so, so basically what you know, these data providers were looking at, the tolls, daily tolls that you know, highways in Germany were collecting from industrial trucks to get a feel for you know, how freight volumes were evolving. That was very interesting. And it's provided on a daily basis, which is great. Because that's what we need. The higher the frequency, the better insights, the more granular information that you get. Another very, very interesting one was back in China. That was also a very, I would say, creative on the part of these data providers. And it was China manufacturing night light intensity. So what these guys did was they were using satellite imagery at night in areas where manufacturing facilities are located in an attempt to understand how much work that they were producing. So the higher the light intensity at night, that means more manufacturing facilities were actually operational and they were producing more. And again, that was, that was a daily data point and that provided us incredibly you know, valuable, timely information. But I mean, we can, we can you know, extend this list and we come across some very, very interesting data points as we do our research, really. Absolutely. And that, that is fascinating. And, and that is probably one of the most interesting learnings in fact thank you so much for for all your help on the plant-based food project that i did and even otherwise helping the students when i go and teach and you gave me your presentation so 
I fully appreciate your help and support. But this is there. It gets really interesting. The technology on its own has got limited value unless it provides actionable insights. And obviously, you guys are doing it. And what's interesting to hear so far from your conversation is research is now starting to become proactive rather than reactive. And this is a very important aspect which is not highlighted in a lot of ways. Research has traditionally been seen as something, oh, why did this happen? Let's ask the research guys. But what will happen? Let's ask the commercial guys. And I think that's the kind of difference which is which is changing now going forward. But another challenge with the fact that so much of data around, you know, sourcing the data, reliability of the data is very crucial. But more importantly, analyzing it and using and filtering that data is even more crucial. So what's kind of exercise? Because you need to take a big picture of demand and supply space. You have got multiple data points. You need to fit all of them into like a jigsaw puzzle, literally. How do you kind of source that data? Do you actually rely more on the government or public data? Or there's a lot of private data that you actually build up as well? I would say, unfortunately, a lot a lot of our data comes from private sources. I say unfortunately because research desks, I mean, at least at Arrow, we don't charge for our research. It's, it's a complimentary uh, service that we provide to our clients. And we, we would like to keep it that way. But that also means we have to spend a lot of money to acquire data. And as data becomes more available, it's also you know, becoming a lot more high in demand, if you like, and prices have been going up. So it's, we, we use multiple data vendors and um, you know, specialist data vendors. And um, you cannot rely on just a single one. You have to have good, timely data in order to be able to do what you what you are supposed to do i mean that's that's absolutely critical and um having just the data or access to data is is not enough you also have to spend hours going through that data pile to validate the source its accuracy its its reliability and that that takes a lot of time as well and then you obviously, in order to be able to do this properly, you need to be very good at advanced data analysis. You know, you need to be able to have the right skill set to, to actually use this data because we're not talking about just a few data points. I mean, when I started doing this back in 2007 at HSBC, we had literally, I'm not going to name the names, but maybe one major data provider, which was really more focused towards financial markets. And then one major shipping data provider, which I guess, you know, anyone can guess who that is. And really, that was it. You know, we had very limited information, but now we are literally going through billions of data points on a daily basis. So in order to do that, you need more than just Excel, you know, skills. You need Python, you need programming, you need all sorts of different, you know, more advanced data analysis tool skills. And um, I guess, you know, that's, 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 that's very critical. And I, that's one of the things that I would recommend, really. I think we're going to talk about this anyway. But, you know, you need to know your way around data, big data. And um, that's something absolutely critical these days. I'm an, a, a bit of a dinosaur these days because, you know, I've been doing this for 17 years. And Excel was more advanced than you needed it to be, you know, like um, to do what we used to do back in, you know, 2007, eight. Now it's different. Now it's very different. I agree. And, and and talking about HSBC, I remember they were mostly period brokers. And I remember in Precious Shipping, we were talking to them for some of the period out business. And being a kind of a long-term focused business or talking about period charters, it's, it's very much about understanding the research part in it. And that point of time, we didn't see the importance of that. But I think HSBC and Heartland, both of them have actually carried on with that uh, space there. And my experience has been uh, that that is very crucial. But let's turn a little bit to geopolitics. And obviously, I, I feel that whenever I have to teach or make a presentation on geopolitics to my students and even companies, I actually find the data or the material changes overnight sometimes, literally because a new event takes on or the current event is actually accelerated to something else altogether. The Red Sea being in point or even Russia, Ukraine being in point. So can you share us any examples where you actually proactive, reactive? How do you weave these geopolitical discussions into a research report where basically you primarily are looking at the demand and supply of shipping, and then you have to kind of figure out what this geopolitical event can bring in terms of a complete tornado or a, a, a damn squib 
in that demand supply scenario? How do, how do you do that, basically? We try to be as proactive as possible, but as you would appreciate, you know, geopolitics, it's a very deep, multidimensional subject, and we are not really experts in, in global geopolitics. That being said, you cannot ignore it. You have to have a view on geopolitics because that has a major impact on global trade, on trade flows, and therefore, you know, our business. So, you know, we try to, you know, highlight the risks of potential geopolitical events taking place, what that means in terms of, of global trade flows, and so on and so forth. And, you know, we do a lot of scenario analysis, you know, because essentially, you know, these are wild card events, even though you get the signs, you know, some time in advance, you know, but it's, it's impossible to predict how things will play out as they go along, because it's, you know, they tend to be very fluid in nature. So scenario analysis comes into play, we tend to have three different views, you know, base case scenario, which is the most likely scenario, and then the, the, the low case scenario, which is a low impact scenario where, you know, we, we see less impact coming through as an outcome of this geopolitical event, and the high case scenario where, you know, we, we, we see high impact, high, high kind of uh, low probability, but high impact event taking place. So what we try to do is we try to provide our clients a few scenarios and their impacts in their trades. I think you know that that probably helps our clients to form their own opinion as well, and um, that's the approach that we've been taking. A few examples, I, I guess you know if you remember at the beginning of the, the the COVID disruption, you know oil markets were extremely volatile. You know I mean no one really knew what was going to happen, and for the first time in history we saw W two I you know U S oil prices dropping below zero. By, we, so minus $40 per barrel. And it was a very exciting time for the tanker market because you know, we suddenly saw an incredible surge in floating storage demand. And people were getting very excited about it. People were thinking, oh, you, this is going to continue forever. And this, you know, it's going to be you know, great for the tankers, which was for a little while. But at the time, I remember you know, putting out a report saying that, look, I mean, this cannot physically cannot continue. And I think, you know, people in the Middle East, you know, big oil producers, OPEC members will have to do something about it. And it was it's going to be dramatic because not only this is sustainable from a physical standpoint, because, you know, what happens when you run out of storage space, right? You, are you going to let the oil flow? Obviously not. So I don't politics, you know, oil prices dropping, you know, to, to zero pretty much. I mean, I, Obviously, OPEC people will not be happy about this. So we put out a report saying that, look, this is gonna, this is nearing a peak. I think this was around April, you know, March, April-ish, when the tanker market was absolutely roaring. We had a lot of pushback at the time because we said, oh, this is probably gonna peak around May, June, and and you know, things will start unwinding after that. And we were very popular at the time, but luckily we were right in our opinion. We saw, you know, massive oil production cuts and which kind of unwound that, that um, floating storage game. Obviously not immediately, but in time. Uh, but that was an interesting, um, you know, example, I, I, I would say, and something that I'm personally proud of anyway, you know, <laughs> because, um, this, because I had a lot of pushback at the time. So, you know, <laughs> so it was good. And the other one was, you know, probably China Aussie coal ban, you know, that was also, I think, happening early stages of the COVID. We argued at the time, look, I mean, China can procure its thermal coal from, from domestic sources or other sources, but it's going to have this, this ban at some point. We didn't know when it would happen, but at some point they would have to lift that ban because there's no other supplier that could substitute Australia for China's, you know, coking coal requirements. And it was it was a markets plus geopolitics kind of view because you know it was a purely geopolitics, but they go hand in hand. I think it's a good example of how geopolitics affect the markets and trade flows. Hundred percent, and 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 just interestingly enough, at that point of time when the coal vessels were sitting in China waiting for unloading because of the ban, you had the other commodities where they did not have China did not have an alternative. They were flowing like nobody's business. Putum in went on, iron ore went on from the same country. So it was like, why are you actually thinking of banning coal? So it was very much geopolitical in nature as, as, as we speak. 
and I think a lot of the um, a lot of the ideas change. Now, I, you know, come to think about it, if you if you go back the time when the iron ore contracts were uh, mostly negotiated by Japanese uh, on a term basis, and the Chinese came and changed the market completely. And and I think that's the kind of stuff which uh, which which is an impact of geopolitics um, because of the rising position of a country. Do you actually also look at country specific challenges from time to time that clients look at, or is it still the big picture that mostly comes in your purview, basically? No, definitely. I mean, you have to have a, you know, you, at least for major players in shipping, you have to have a view on country specific, you know, specifics as well. I mean, China is it's a very good example, I would say. I mean, um, in the past, and it's still an ongoing uh, matter in the past, if you remember past two decades, whenever the global economy was was slowing, whenever there was a, a slowdown in the Chinese economy, policymakers came up with a stimulus, a bazooka style stimulus, where they flooded the market with money. They were building bridges, you know, airports, you know, new cities even to prop up the economy. But that's not the case right now. There's a very clear political change, policy shift, if you like, in China. And they don't see the property market as a, as a you know, as a, as a remedy for the economic woes. And that's also a very politically driven um, kind of um, decision. And so, you know, that's that's one thing. And I think we were talking about, you know, how Indian subsidies on sugar exports, I think, if I remember, you know, all of this, it's, it's you have to have country specific, you know, views and analysis as well, it's at least on major players anyway. So as we come closer to the end of the end of the discussion, this podcast is not just uh, something that the industry professionals listen to, but this is also something that my students and other students listen to a lot. I actually generally feel that when I teach geopolitics, I really want to see the kind of connection that students can build with some serious thought leaders like you and others. And this is a great avenue to do that. So maybe if you can just share some perspectives as to You've already talked about the importance of understanding data and data analytics in your course of study. Must take on, uh, must have that as a part of your toolkit. But what other tips do you have? If you're looking for a young person to come and join Arrow team in the research side, what kind of criteria would you kind of think about? And I'm sure they have changed over the years before when you started because the technology is a different space now. But I would say some core values remain there. Some core competencies still remain so it'll be interesting to hear what you look for in 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 the next gen research uh, gurus i would say yeah no absolutely i think that's a really really good point and you know that's something that we struggle you know with as well because the new generation needs to be curious right you know as if you want to be a good analyst you have to be curious you have to you know dig deep and you shouldn't be afraid of just going off tangents you know going off piece a little, a little bit when you you know, doing your research, because that's the only way that you can discover new ideas, new data points, which then, you know, generates more and more, you know, analysis, more insights. If you just focus on your little task at the time, then you will miss out on so many different opportunities. So curiosity is, is absolutely critical in my view. And um, you should not be afraid of maybe spending an hour or two on things that you discover, you know, during your research. I mean, that's that's one thing that that happens to me a lot as well, actually, you know, just to give you an example from my own life or, or, or on, on kind of experience. I mean, we talked about data points, right? Data providers, they literally have millions of data points. I think most of them have in excess of three to four million data points each. So when you're looking for specific data, you obviously don't know where it is. You don't need to start your search and so on and so forth. Don't be afraid of, oh, you know, just going off piece. If you see something interesting, just go in there, you know, go there and discover, explore what that means and how you can use it in your day-to-day -day analysis. Because that's the only way that you can come up with original analysis and insights. That's one thing. And be creative as well. Don't think, you know, think, I, I hate to use this word, but think outside the box. You need to be creative. How can I look at it from a different perspective? There are many different ways of looking at the same data, same same information, and try to discover the, the relationships to not just a certain market or a certain segment and what that could mean for other sectors as well. So that's multidimensional thinking, I, I would say. And probably, I mean, one thing that, you know, 
I, I really benefited from working at a global bank and it's in, in their investment banking army is, you know, you really have to think like an investor, a trader or an owner. If you start thinking just like a pure researcher or an analyst, you will miss out on so many different things. You will miss out on the commercial aspects, geopolitical aspects of, of how, how our business works. So ask yourself the question, why this person is asking me this question? He's a trader. What does he want to know? Why is he asking me this or requires this data? What could he use it for? And I think that's the only way that you can really, you know, become a multidimensional thinker and, uh, and, uh, and, a, and a successful analyst, really, a strategist. I find that to be one of the one of the other things which is missing in the next gen in some cases is the ability to focus for a longer duration on a particular topic. So I think the, the speed at which they gather data and the speed at which they analyze data is sometimes very fast, but then you have to pause yourself and you know go a bit more into it and focus on it. So I find that to be reading, reading is becoming a, a kind of a old school space now. I think it's a generational thing, definitely, because as I said, when I started doing this back in 2007, eight, we really needed to work hard to find the information. We really needed to go deep, you know, find clues as to, okay, where can I find this information? Search, you know, government, you know, agencies, websites. And, you know, we really worked hard to get the data that we needed, information that we needed. Right now, you know, people use chat, chat GPT. They say, okay, find me this. And it spits out an answer. And I think that makes people lazy. People forgot to, to, to kind of question the validity, the accuracy of, of the information that they're getting. And that's what I guess puts us, the previous generation, in a different place because we are always suspicious. We're always curious. Is this correct? Is this, you know, is this accurate? And that's absolutely key in what we do. You know, you need to be curious. You need to question stuff. Interesting. And that kind of nearly comes to the end of the, on the show. One of the areas which I'm involved personally outside of this uh, podcast space is, of course, with some startups and things like that. Do you actually see the ability to pick up people from outside the industry, people who are in the trading courses or, or in other faculties to come into the industry? What is it that you can kind of bring in? I know once you're in, as you said, once you're in, you're in. But, but to bring them in is something which is an interesting. So what's the kind of carrot do you think that the industry has to offer, especially from your research perspective, that we, you should kind of pitch and say, here you come, guys. Here's something interesting for you to pursue as a career. Um, what's that carrot, do you think? Well, that's, that's a good question. I think what I really like about our industry and what I do is there is never a dull moment in shipping. Shipping is, is a global business. It's everywhere. It's in our everyday life. You meet so many different people from so many different backgrounds, from the commodity markets, from ship owning markets, operators, traders, and you learn a lot as you go along. You know, I, you know, I still learn a lot in every, pretty much every meeting that I attend. You know, and that's that's what makes our business very exciting, very fresh. That's I think you know, instead of just sitting there crunching numbers of listed companies, you know, trying to predict their profits in the next quarter, quarter after that. Of course, I'm not, you know, that, that's a great business as well. Great job too. But what we do is it's, it's alive and it's a very much of a person people business. I think that's what, that's what really makes our job very exciting and yeah, fresh. Absolutely. I, I used to, I used to tell my team um, in Glavines that you can have three port calls in the same port over three years with the same cargo on the same ship and come out with a different statement of facts. And that's what the idea is. You can actually have three different experiences of the same cargo, same ship at the same time of the year, exactly going there. It's like a line of service can even create different challenges. And it's a line of service, for God's sake. It's supposed to do regular trips all the time. So that's what makes it fascinating. I fully agree with you. Barak, absolutely lovely talking to you. I, it's always a pleasure. You are actually going to find that this aspect of geopolitics is becoming brighter and bigger, but more importantly, it's getting complicated, which means you have a big job on your hand and your team is going to have to do a lot more. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast, and we look forward to joining you on the next episode.